Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments, where tonight we're going to take a look at the world of Pi. And tonight our two presenters, Karen and Arena, have approximately done Pi number of webinars uh, for us on Pi Day. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus there at Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make those tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. Again, with us tonight is Karen Camp and Arena Lublinskaya. Arena is a T-Cube national instructor, and she has been teaching for over 35 years, uh, teaching mathematics and physics at the university as well as the high school level. Currently, she's a professor at the Teachers College in Columbia University. She's an author of 21 books about teaching mathematics and science with technology, and has been using various educational technology for over 30 years, conducting workshops and workshops for science and mathematics teachers internationally. So, Rena, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. And Karen was instructor of mathematics education at Yale University for 15 years and previously taught high school and middle school mathematics in Connecticut and Pennsylvania. She's been a T-Cube national instructor since 1998, uh, providing professional development at conferences, workshops, and webinars. Karen speaks often on how to use technology effectively to enhance student understanding. Karen, it's great to have you with us as well. I'm glad to be here, Mike. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send any questions to Arena or Karen using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. So without further ado, Arena, you have control. Feel free to share your screen. Sorry, I was trying to figure out after sharing screen how to unmute. Uh, sometimes that happens. Uh, so let me uh, then um, talk a little bit. So teachers around the world uh, celebrate Pi Day. And so today we decided to share activity that inspired us, uh, the activities that ins were inspired by activities developed by our fellow teachers from all over the world. And to celebrate our own heritage, we start in the US and we'll finish in Russia. But we'll visit on the way four different uh, continents and five different countries. As you can see on the map, we'll, after US, we'll go to Latin America, then to China, to Australia, to Sweden, and then to Russia. So, uh, we uh, would like to share with you today balance of activities for TI-84 and TI-INSPIRE. And activities uh, will range uh, from, from uh, pre-algebra to calculus, and we hope that will address the needs of everyone who is here with us today. And now I want to pass uh, the ball to Karen. And uh, here we go. Thanks, Irina. Tonight, after um, your experience with this webinar, we hope that you'll be able to say, I can select exciting activities for my students for Pi Day. I can integrate TI technology in my teaching about Pi, and I can connect ideas about Pi to different mathematics topics across various levels. So, like Mike said, um, I, Irina and I have done uh, about pi many pi day webinars and we have lots of great ideas and we'll make sure that you can see those past webinar links at the very end but we still found more uh, and like Irina said we were inspired by activities that others have used 
uh, using TI technology across the globe. But let's begin here in the US and so many of our Pi Day celebrations in the US involve the digits of Pi. Either we have students memorize the digits, who can say, memorize more, who can say them faster. And I started to think about what we could do with the digits of Pi and this, um, this list here, this colored list, the colored image is the first 40 digits of pi. So what do you notice about those 40 digits and what do you wonder? Let us know in the chat. And I'm hoping that you noticed that the digits are color coded so that Every digit one is in orange and every digit four is in purple. And that made me think, what could we find out about the digits? Are they distributed equally? Uh, does it matter if we look at just a few digits or if we look at many, many digits? So our first activity is going to be digit discoveries. So let's go over to our TI-84. And uh, first of all, just want to do a quick note about precision. Uh, the TI-84 pi button is uh, right above the exponentiation caret, so second pi. And you might, in your classroom, um, have students typing 3.14, which is a perfectly good approximation to two decimals. But the pi button on the TI-84 is going to get you uh, 10 significant figures, and it's going to give you nine digits after the decimal point. If you're on your TI Inspire, that pi button will get you between 11 and 13 digits after the decimal, depending on your settings. You can set your TI Inspire to float 12 significant digits or fix 12 decimal places. And so even though 3.14 might be um, convenient or easy in math class, keep in mind that you can have accumulated rounding errors, so go for your pi button. So, uh, for our digit activity, the first question was, how are these digits of pi distributed? Um, what I did is I entered the first 100 digits of pi into my stat lists. And if you're unfamiliar with how to do uh, statistics and lists on your calculator, our webinar documents have some introductory information and how to's. But in my uh, list one, I just have the numbers one to 100. In my list two, I have the decimal digits of pi. So three is not a decimal digit, but 3.141592653588. And I have all 100 digits or the first 100 digits in there. So I'm going to take a look at this in a histogram. I go to second stat plot. My uh, first stat plot, I'm going to turn that one on. I have selected histogram. Uh, my X list is L2. If your calculator has a different list listed there, the list uh, keys are right above the number one, two, three, four, five, six. So second two will get me L2. Um, when you go back to Y equals, you'll see that plot one is highlighted, which means it's going to be on. We're going to set a window. My X values are going to be my uh, digits of pi. So I'm going from negative 1 to 11. And what's important with a histogram is that the x scale is going to be your bin width. So let's take a look. And there is our histogram. And if we trace along the histogram, we can see we have um, eight digits in the first hundred that are 0, and 8 that are 1, and 12 that are 2 and 11 that are three, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay, we can also, if we are interested, see how those digits are uh, spread. If you'd like, you can do a box and whisker plot on that. And so I have that on plot two. And let me just make sure my window has enough headroom. Yep, I think it has enough headroom. Here is that box and whisker plot. And not surprisingly, um, you know, our um, box and whisker plot has a median of five. These are not surprising, uh, but those of you who teach these in your classrooms might want to take a look. 
And finally, we're going to take a look at one variable statistics on my list of pi. So stat, calc, one variable statistics, and I want my list to be list two. And calculate. And it shows that the mean is a 4.77. So if I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then I've got 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, it looks like my expected mean, if they were completely equally spaced, would be 4.5. So maybe in these first 100 digits, I have a few more that are in the 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, in any case, there's your one variable statistics. And you can see, of course, the min, the max, the median, and things like that. And um, what I would ask my students, you know, are the digits distributed equally in these 100? Do you think that our distribution would change if we entered 200 digits or 500 digits? Um, because when you add more data points, usually we get more of our expected outcomes, our expected um, equal amounts. Um, what other questions could you ask your students about these digits? I'm going to turn off some of my plots while you're thinking about what you might want to be able to do with your students. You can turn them off quickly just by arrowing up in Y equals and pressing enter. So the second activity um, that I imagined with the digits is that we would have our digit readers. So we would time our students reading the digits of pi. So my first student would read 10 decimal digits and we time them. And then the second student would read 20 decimal digits and each student who reads would add an additional number, an initial 10 digits. And so these were the times in seconds for readers of digits, uh, one, 10, 20, 30, up to 100 digits. And so let's take a look at that scatter plot. And I've got a scatter plot. I'm going list three and list four. And I need to change my window. By the way, when I uh, ask students about windows, sorry, I want students to tell me what would be an appropriate window. I try to avoid using the Zoom stat. It's a nice quick way to get an, a window that would work, but I like to see my um, my axes, and I would ask students. It's a skill that I want students to have. Uh, so I'm going to do from x from negative 10 to, uh, let's say, 120. I know I only have 100 digits in there. I'm going to make my x scale uh, 10. My y min, I'm going to go from negative 5 to 50. I'm going to leave the y scale alone for the moment. Let's see what this graph looks like. And there we have it. It's not a bad linear uh, approximation. And so now we want to get a line of best fit. And one of the things that you may not be familiar with in stat calc, um, we have all of our regular regressions, which we'll see in a minute, but way at the bottom, we have a manual fit for y equals mx plus b. And this is an opportunity for you to imagine laying down a straight edge and fitting a line by sight, either with a ruler or a piece of dry pasta. So manual fit is gonna ask me where I wanna store the equation. I'm gonna use alpha trace to get the y1 shortcut. And then I'm gonna to go to calculate. And what I need to do here is I need to drop my points and you can drop your points either on a, um, an actual data point or out in space. It's not going, going slowly. Okay, so here is my first data point, whoops. The good news with manual fit is that you have the opportunity to fix it up later. Okay, so I pressed enter on my first point, and then I'm going to get out a little line here. And like I said, you don't have to use, you don't have to use a point that is a data point. 
just eyeball where you think the line of best fit should go. And press enter when you're ready for your second data point. Okay, and once you've done that, you get an opportunity to edit the line of best fit. So I take a look. My slope is listed as 0.3667. I think my slope looks decent. I can arrow to the right and I can change my Y intercept. Maybe I want to make that a little bit shorter. I can make that 3.1. Okay. And when I'm done, you'll see this word, this uh, little note done, which is right above the graph button. And it's going to save our line of best fit. We can compare that, see if we were, uh, how our line of best fit compared to the linear regression. So I'm going to choose stat calc linear regression. My X list is going to be L3. My Y list is L4. I'm going to store this one in Y2. And we're going to take a look. And when I graph it, ooh, I did a really good job tonight with my linear regression and my line of best fit. So um, that is an activity that you can do to celebrate the digits of pi, but at the same time, you can um, uh, use your technology and your statistics. To make predictions, you might ask, how long would it take to read 500 digits? How long would it take to read 1,000 digits? I would do alpha trace to grab my Y1, and I'm going to ask, how long would it take to read 500 digits? Well, gee, that's going to take 186 seconds or 1,000 digits. And you can think about what other predictions your students could make. Okay, we're going to move right along to our next idea of how to celebrate pi, and that is to take a look at radian measure. And these activities were inspired by a, an activity created by a Latin American user of TI Inspire. So let's get over to our TI Inspire. And we're going to begin with radian measure. And this activity is actually available straight off the TI US um, uh, Activity Center. And it's also in your webinar documents. But what you're going to do here is you're going to open up your circle. You're going to drag your open circle. And the question is, what happens when the arc length and the radius are equal? So if I drag to right here, my arc length is one unit and my radius is one unit and my um, angle is one radian. Radians is an angle measure. Okay, well, what about if I make my arc length two units twice as big as my radius? That's going to be two radians. Three units, which is three times as big as my radius, is going to be three radians. And these relationships are going to hold true, true even if we change the radius. So if I have double my radius, that's going to be a two radian angle measure regardless of what my radius of my circle is. The second page of this activity is asking students to grab this open circle and open it up all the way as far as it'll go on this image, and that is half a circle. And how many um, radians are in our half a circle? And it is pi radians, 3.14 radians. And so the radian measure of 180 degrees is pi. And this shows us how pi and 180 are equal to each other. You can do a 90 degree angle and get approximately 1.57 radians, which is pi over two. And these proportions help you convert either radians to degrees or degrees to radians. Let me jump over to the actual Latin American file. We've done some translating here. And the uh, definition of a radian is a radian is defined as the measure of an angle that intercepts an arc length equal to the radius. And so they also have here 
a uh, same kind of a thing that we showed in the other file. But what I wanted to show you in this file is this question. How many times does the arc length fit in the circumference when we have an arc length equal to the radius? And so there, a little clicker here, we have uh, one radius, two radii, three, four, five, six. But you notice there's a little bit left over. And in order to figure out whether the circle size matters, this same image shows that we have six and a little bit radii that fit around the outside of the circle. And did you notice that there was a gap? Why do you think that there's a gap? And then the activity prompts the students to divide the circumference by the radius. And of course, when we do that, uh, the circumference divided by the radius is going to be 6.28 approximately, or 2 pi. Before we leave this Latin American file, they have a really nice, um, a really nice uh, converter uh, that you can convert your angle measures. Let's get a nice angle measure here. 30 degrees. Can I get there? Come on, 30 degrees. There we go. And you can see here that we've got the pi over six. So this file, which you'll see in your webinar documents has a nice converter. And the last fun thing on this file is an application question because radians become very nice to use in situations where we care about the number of turns. So here we have a painter wheel and we need to paint a line on a road. How many revolutions does the wheel have to make in order to paint a line of a certain distance? And so we can see our line is going to paint out, and you can have students answering applications like this. Um, I've got even more fun stuff to do, so I'll let you play with that on your own. Um, and let's go to our last piece of radians. And um, with radians here, what I want to do is, hold on, I've got to move something here. Okay, that. I need to delete. Okay, here we go. What I want to do, no, I do not want to delete everything. Okay, what I want to do here, let me press escape because I'm doing something here. Okay, on my circle, what I want to do is I want to use a geometry command in the construction menu called measurement transfer. And what I want to do is I want to take my radius, I want to transfer it to the circle, and I want to start at this point right here. Okay, so now I've got my little arc here. I'm going to create a point on that part of the circle right there. And the reason why I need that point is I want to make a circle arc so you can see it. In the points and lines, we have a circle arc tool. And let's just make this arc. circle arc. I want to make it easier to see. So I want to make it thick and I want to make it a fun color. Okay, so there's my circle arc. Whoops, the point is the circle arc instead of the circle. Okay. Here we go. There's my, there is my circle arc. And what I want to do here is I want to Again, measure my angle. This angle here is, let's pull that up. This angle is exactly one radian because it's the angle that opens up one radius length along the circumference. So that's another one that you can do. You can continue to measurement transfer around the outside and you can measure the leftover arc, which is going to be about 0.28 radians left over at the end. And if you want to see what that looks like with degrees, hit the degrees at the top of your TI Inspire and it's about 57. Three degrees. So that got me thinking if 180 degrees is pi radians, what would happen 
if uh, where else could I find pi pop up? when we use radian measure. So I'm still in degrees here. And what I've done is I've created a triangle and we measure, I measure all the angles and these have a lots of digits of accuracy and you, you may not wanna use the, that many digits of accuracy when you're dealing with algebra one or geometry students. But we know that if we add up the three angles of a triangle, we get 180 degrees. But what happens if we add them up in radians? So these angles are already measured I switch back over to radians and wowee, check it out. My angles are gonna add up to 3.14159 radians. Okay, what happens if I take a look at a quadrilateral? Now this quadrilateral looks like I've got four 90 degree angles. Those of you who've done dynamic geometry before know that you can construct 90 degree angles or you can draw 90 degree angles that could later be manipulated. So I am going to manipulate them. But let's take my text, I calculate, and I want to select my four angles. And it looks like my four angles add up to 6.28 radians, two pi radians. And yes, this uh, uh, these are not right angles. It was drawn in that way. Um, but whatever your quadrilateral is, they uh, interior angles add up to 2 pi. What about a pentagon? Well, let's check it out. Calculate. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And here's my number. I really am not sure if that's 3 pi or not. So what I did is I created a little slider clicker. That's 2 pi. And indeed, this is 3 pi. Okay, let's take a look at one more, a hexagon. And you guessed it. If I calculate adding up 6 interior angles, I'm going to get 4 pi. So I thought that this was another fun way to investigate radian measure. And what is also really cool is that you can use this even if you have a convex polygon. Now, you'll notice I lost my 4 pi here because I used this outside angle. But I used a tool, an angle measuring tool, called a directed angle tool to measure the inside of that angle. And so let me add this up one more time. Calculate one, two, the inside one, four, five, six. And indeed, even with a convex polygon, it will work. Okay, so then this activity wraps up. Uh, I would ask my students, how many sides does a polygon have to have if the sum of its interior angles is 10 pi? So create a polygon, measure it with the directed angle tool and calculate the sum of the angles and left them a blank page. And I actually did it and indeed it does work, but we're running short on time. So I'm gonna let this be and leave you to that. The last idea before I pass it to Irina that I'm going to share is the idea of periodic motion and pendulums. So far, we've looked at pi as an irrational number and in circular measures and ratios. Um, but let's see if we can use a stopwatch to find pi. And the period of a pendulum is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the length divided by the acceleration due to gravity. And so on our pendulum pi, what I've done here is I've put into a spreadsheet page lengths, one, two, three, four. And in the period column, I've put in the formula. Period is two times pi times the square root of length divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. And if we take a look here, we can see what the different periods are. And it looks like pi would be found somewhere between two and three meters of pendulum length. Well, let's check it out. Let us 
ask ourselves what would happen if we solved that formula. So I'm using a CAS TI Inspire, solve the pendulum formula, which is two pi, here's the pi button for TI Inspire users, two pi times the square root of pendulum length L divided by G, the acceleration due to gravity, I want to make my period equal to pi. And I want to solve that and ask ourselves what length will make that work. Okay, it tells me I need a pendulum length that is uh, the acceleration due to gravity amount divided by four. Let me grab that arrow up and enter. And I'm going to grab my vertical bar and I'm going to say, well, I know that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Oops, forgot to tell it what G was, that that was G, sorry. Grab it again, and what I need to say is G equals 9.8. And it's going to tell me that a pendulum length of 2.45 meters will give us a period of pi. So if you could find a place in your school that has a place where you could hang a 2.45 meter pendulum, a little bit more than eight feet, maybe in a stairwell. And what I suggest is that you put a piece of tape on the floor and you measure the, um, the period, you time the period from the middle of that tape and have it go through one full cycle back and forth, keep the amplitude pretty small and measure 10 cycles. And you will find out that indeed those 10 cycles will take you about 31.4159 seconds. Um, so that's another really fun idea for you to use. And of course, if you're using um, US units, if you're using feet, you can use uh, U.S. units, and it could be uh, 32 meters per uh, feet per second squared. Um, I want to give everything over to Irina, and she's going to take a look at some other contexts for pi, circular measures, randomness, and infinity. And so, Irina, you are all set. Karen, if you, yeah, great. Thank you so much, Karen. And uh, let me now share my screen. And we'll go to the, okay, so very good. Okay, um, so uh, the first activity that we would like to talk about is a Monte Carlo simulation that um, really uh, is an activity uh, where students can use the concept of probability, geometric probability, in order to estimate pi. So in this Monte Carlo method, uh, we are going to generate points randomly, uniformly distributed, uh, that will uh, hit the uh, inside the square with the side one. And uh, we really are looking at how many of those points are plotted inside the quarter circle. So if you think about it, that we have here a circle of a radius of one, and we have a square, of, a, of the side one. And the question is, uh, what is the probability that a point will be inside the quarter circle? Well, it would be very easy for students to find the area of a quarter circle and find the uh, area of a square and find out geometric probability. And uh, we will see that this geometric probability is related to pi. So let's take a look how we can do it on TI-84. So this activity is inspired by activity developed in T-Cube Europe in Sweden. And uh, uh, with a little modifications, we're going to take a look at this activity. So the first thing that we would like to do is to generate these points on the coordinate plane. Now, each point has two coordinates, right? X-coordinate and Y-coordinate. And we want it to be randomly distributed. So we will need to use a random generator to, to, to uh, create or to generate coordinates of those points. But remember, random generator on TI-Inspire, it's still 
technology, right? So there is some algorithm there. So the first thing that you really want to do is to make sure that all of your students have different seed value. Otherwise, if they use default settings, everybody will get exactly the same random numbers all the time. So in order to do that, you can ask students to take, for example, last four digits of their phone number, of their cell phone number, and then store that in the command rand, which you can find under math probability. That's the first command, you press enter, and that will set the seed, which will be different for everybody. Now, we need pair of coordinates, so we're gonna use lists. So we're gonna go to start edit, and list one will be our um, X coordinates, and we would like this to be a random number between zero and one, so we will use a rand command. And of course, we wanna generate a lot of points, so let's start with 300. So go to math, probability, enter, and let's say 300. So when we press enter, it will generate points between zero and one, uh, numbers between zero and one. And we will do exactly the same thing for list two. And this way we will have 300 pairs of points that we can plot on the coordinate plane. So let's set up a scatter plot. So in this scatter plot, uh, we would like, uh, so let's go to plot one. So we want uh, to turn it on. We want scatter plot uh, not connected. List one is our X list and Y list is list two. And I selected crosses rather than squares to easier see the points. And so now uh, the let's go to zoom and we want it to look like a square and quarter circle. So that's why we're going to use zoom square option that makes units the same, unit scales the same on X and Y coordinates. So I'm going to press five. And now we see all our points and they are uniformly distributed uh, randomly pretty much. So now let's try to find out how many of those points are inside uh, the quarter circle. So let's go back to start, edit. So what we're going to do in list three, we're going to set up uh, the uh, equation here or values uh, for the, uh, we're gonna find the distance of each point from the origin using distance formula. So, and the other part is, uh, we are going to use here uh, quotation marks, which are right here, alpha quotation mark. And the reason for that is that if you want to do and generate a randomly different set of numbers, then if you use quotation marks, it will, allow, it will automatically recalculate your distances for each point. So we're going to second square root, I pressed uh, second square root. And then we have our least one squared, right? So let's put parentheses, second least one squared plus least two squared. And let's make sure we close our quotation mark. Press enter. So now we may see that some distances are larger than one and some distances are smaller than one. So we want to count how many of those uh, distance, how many of those points actually inside the circle. So their distance or value of L3, right, is less or equal than one. So that we're going to do in list four. So let's set up again quote mark, quotation marks. So if we ever want to rerun list one and list two, this will be recalculated. And we are going to set, up, set a logic condition that list three should be less or equal than one. So this is under test. So you go second math, notice there's a test here, and that's where we will find our inequality symbol. And we want this to be less than one. Let's press enter. So it will do little calculations. And now we see zeros and ones. So zero means it's outside of the circle and one means it's inside or on the circle. So now it's very simple for us to just calculate the sum of list four to find how many points uh, got inside the um, 
who have a circle. Uh, so let's go back to the, uh, now go to the list operations and under math here, and I put my cursor in list five just in the cell and under math, we can go to sum and we want a sum of list four. And we got 241 points. So there's total of 300 points and 241 points uh, landed. So the uh, experimental probability, right, is going to be 241 divided by 300. Now, but theoretical probability is the area of a quarter circle of radius of one, which is pi over four, right? And over the area of a square of side one, which is one. So the theoretical probability is pi over four. So in order to find pi, all we need to do is to multiply this value by four. And we got pretty close. Now, we only run 300 numbers. But we can run, of course, many more numbers. And so that you know, in the list, you can have maximum of 999 data points. So we could run it with 999 data points and see if that will give us more precise relationship. So let's try to see how it's going to work. Uh, let me go back to edit and go all the way back to list one. And now I'm going to set up here math probability. Now, it may take a little longer, of course, to count uh, random or to generate 999 numbers. So, but I click here, it does it. And uh, the reason it gave us error, because remember, we L2 is right now has only three values. So I'm going to leave l3 uh -huh. it doesn't want to do it sorry uh it doesn't let me escape from here so unfortunately we probably just need to run still not 300 numbers in order to be able to do that uh and not um the uh, so you Okay, so I'm not going to go there, but you can run 999 numbers or you can rerun 300 numbers and it will recalculate easier uh, all the values so that different students, of course, will generate different probabilities and you can compare those in class and talk to the students about the situation. Both you can connect it to experimental and theoretical probability. You can talk to them about Monte Carlo method here, but also Talk about the approximations of pi and how uh, precise we can approximate pi of this approach. Now, let's go to the next activity. And this is the activity we wanted to come back because it's such a beautiful activity. It connects a lot of interesting uh, topics. Uh, you can work with it at calculus level. You can work with it at non-calculus level. And... Uh, Bufon's needle, this activity is inspired by T-Cube Australia, and we're going to use the file that developed, uh, the Inspire file that was developed in by Australian team. So think about this activity. Imagine that you have a floor made of parallel strips of wood, and each has exactly the same width. And then you drop a needle onto the floor. So the question is, how can we find the probability that the needle will lie across a line between two strips okay so this problem in general has a lot of different options uh, that you, this problem is considered when the needle length is larger than distance between two stripes it could be smaller than distance between two stripes we will consider special case when the length of the needle is equal exactly to the distance between two strips and uh, that is this activity so how are we going to use it? In this activity first, we are using the Inspire simulation of dropping needles. And in this simulation, the Inspire counts how many uh, uh, it generates the needle and the students manually count how many hits. So this is really could be done in Inspire, but it also could be done in as a physical experiment where students can be dropping uh, much or toothpick 
on a paper, right, which has uh, drawn lines and see how many times out of how many times they drop it, how many times it's going to hit. And then we're going to look at how we can actually uh, find the probability. And again, with entire Inspire, it will give us a program uh, uh, which is coded to find the probability depending on the number of hits. And then we'll look at the mathematics behind this activity. So let's go first to the TI Inspire document. And as we already mentioned earlier in the chat, that all the documents, handouts that uh, come along with those activities and all the files for TI Inspire and TI T4 will, will be provided to you uh, as part of the old documents for this webinar. So this is the activity. So the first part here is the program, Buffon's Needle program. So uh, again, it is very important that the students set up a random seed right on the first page. So I'm going to go here and uh, press enter. Let me just make sure we go get there. And I guess because I didn't change, so let me just change it so that we see how it's happening. So the students will enter some number, uh, whatever that you tell them, that last digit of the phone number. And when it says done, it means they set up a different random seat. The command here is already set up for them. And you may notice that we can go to the next page now. So in order to move to the next page, we press control right arrow. And this is the simulation. So uh, let me go all the way to, so let's start like, uh, at the beginning, right? So the first, we really manually count. So the counter here counts how many times we dropped it and we manually like using tallies or just counting how many times it really hit. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 13, 14. So 14 out of 20. I'm going to only do 20, but it is better that the students do at least 100. It could be quick. One person, if they're working in pairs, one person can count, another one click. They don't need to really look at uh, how many times because it's taken care of, only looking at number of hits. So we have 14 out of 20. So let's go to the next page and look at this 14 divided by 20. And that's the experimental probability that we got. Now I'm using CAS, so if I want to get approximate number, let me put control enter. So I got 0.7, but so what, right? How is it related to pi? What do I need to do uh, here? So here's what I need to do. I need to know how it is related to pi. And if we do mathematics, which we're going to look at a little bit later, we'll find out that this probability is 2 over pi. Um, so what I need to do is then divide 2 over this number. So let's go 2 divided by uh, the uh, our result. And we got 2.85. Of course, only 20 hits. That's not that really high probability. Like we need much larger statistics when we're dealing with probabilities. So. Let's get into the next part and uh, take a look around that program, okay? So the program is called, oops. The program is called Buffon. So we're gonna run this program. It will ask how many trials we wanna take. So we, of course, we want a lot of trials. So let's start with the 1000. And it will give us a hits, 626 hits. So 626 out of 1,000, right? So if I take then now 1,000, uh, multiply by 2 and divide by 626, control, enter, we get way closer to pi. So this is a good activity. Students can enter 10,000, and we can again discuss the concept of probability in large numbers. But also, this activity, if you want to bring it to your upper level students in calculus, it leads to very interesting mathematics. And so let's take a look at that. So 
think about the situation. If we think about two stripes and the needle of the length, the same as that distance, right? Then let's think about this end of the needle. The end of the needle, uh, distance from the left stripe. We're only going to look at probability hitting the left stripe right now. If we call it X, it relates, uh, it can change from zero to one, right? If it lands, this end lands right here, then for any angle, it, it, it hit the line. But if it's on this side, the point A is on this side, then the only one position possible when angle is zero. So if I look at the relationship between the length and this distance, then we see that the L, the one, let it be length of one, then cosine of the angle, right? The X needs to be less than cosine of the angle in order to hit the line. So now we think about this situation. X is changing possible values of X. Point A, distance of point A from this line is between zero and one. And possible angles, angle values, if we just look at all the symmetry, it's really between zero and pi over two because the rest is uh, the same exactly, symmetrical. So if I now look at function here, I will graph distance from zero to one along y-axis, so that's my x, right? And I look at the values, possible values of angle, and I know the function is cosine angle, cosine of the angle. Then within this rectangle, which is pi over two over here side and one side here, anytime the distance is bounded by this cosine of the angle, right? Function. Then if it hits here, then it will hit the line. But if it's outside of this, curve, the values, right, relationship between x and an angle, then it will not. So all we're looking for, again, geometric probability of this area under the cosine and this area, which is just pi over 2. And so the area under the function of cosine between 0 and pi over 2, we can calculate and we see it is 2 over pi, sine pi over 2, sorry, and then we divide it by pi over 2, so the probability becomes 2 over pi, or oh, which means the pi is 2 over probability. So this is a really good visual and calculus application of this particular problem. And now let's move uh, to the last problem because I need to give time to Mike to finish up this. So the last problem was inspired by a Russian activity that uh, asks students to program, to code uh, two different series, Leibniz series and Euler series to see which one converges faster in order to estimate pi. And it's interesting that in Russia, um, back in 18th century, people came up with a, a statement, right, uh, which has uh, different words, and it's really about pi, but each word has as many letters as this digit of pi. So back in the 18th century, the uh, people in Russia could remember first 10 digits uh, decimals of pi easily because of that rhyme. And it will be in a handout for those of you who are interested. But here, let's take a look. So in Russia, people don't use TI. So I took the idea and I coded, uh, created two programs. One's called Leibniz and one is called uh, uh, Euler, which use this particular series. And it's a great way for those of you who are teaching BC calculus to look at the series and properties of series. If we look here, the Leibniz series is alternating series because it has minus plus, minus plus, and it converges to pi over four. While early series is not alternating, it adds a positive number each next term. So in this particular activity, in this program, uh, we, uh, for the I-84, uh, so let me just uh, clear uh, and go to the programs. So in this particular program, uh, the pi is calculated using this series. And if we use Euler, and we can say, okay, we can ask students, if you use the same number of terms, the program calculates consecutive partial sums, then will you get the same precision of pi? So let's just run it for 10 consecutive terms. And the program generates partial sums, first two numbers, three numbers, four numbers, five numbers, and so on. And we got a few 
for nine and so on. What about the Leibniz series? If we go to Leibniz and generate also 10 numbers, and let's press enter, sorry, row two, I put 10 too early. I need to first run the program and then put 10. So now we watch the uh, first 10 partial sums of the Leibniz series. This is a good way to ask students, what do you see? What's the difference here? And we hope that students will see that, um, oops, sorry, um, that in earlier series, right, the each next sum was larger than the previous one, while in the, and I'm gonna run it with just the five numbers so it's faster, so each next number is larger than the previous one because we are adding a positive number uh, and uh, to the previous partial sum. While in Leibniz, uh, this is not happening, right? Because each next sum is smaller and then it gets larger and then it gets smaller. And we hope students recognize that and understand the difference between the alternating and uh, positive series. And they can also look at the uh, convergence here and discuss convergence and how fast the convergence is happening. The interesting questions here would be, if you want to get the same precision of pi, uh, then how many terms you need in one series and another? How many terms do you need to get precision to a hundred, to a thousand, and so on? So, Besides the fact that the programs will be provided to you, I want to show you how the programs look like. So this is free uh, screenshots of this program for Leibniz, and this is earlier. And if you look, it's simple. It's just using a single loop where we have a counter. We set up, uh, we ask students for how many numbers. And then for there is a counter, right, for this n, we get k changing from 0 to n, and we creating a partial sum, it first starts at zero. We're adding first term when k equals to zero and storing again partial sum. And then it goes back to the loop until it reaches n and add to the previous value of the sum of previous numbers, a next term in the series. So very straightforward. If you want your students to do coding in math classroom, this would be uh, something that they can do fairly easy after, of course, some introductions. And, but if you don't, you could just use those programs with your students and they could uh, like discuss calculus questions like convergence, like how, what is partial sum, like uh, how we can use it, the how fast things converge and why. And so these are very interesting ways to explore. So the last thing I want to show you is uh, that if you don't want to use coding, you can still use uh, sigma notation, a sum. On the calculator, it is uh, right here in your uh, math type menu. So under alpha F2, you have those shortcuts. And notice number two is a summation. It will bring to the calculator this template. And so the students can use this template and do partial sums uh, several times. Like they can say, okay, let's go from um, the uh, K or N equals uh, zero to one first, and then they enter the value, right? And then end from zero to two, or they can just use previous and add the next term. So you can use the summation or you can use summation on the screen to explore convergence if you don't use the codes. And uh, I believe, yep, yeah, uh, I promised that Mike will have at least Go to the last slide, Can Irina, I, yes, to get I am the, uh... right there. So just to give you like our past Pi Day webinars, uh, there are links. They will be in the presentation when you get it. Uh, we had two, one in, uh, three years ago, one two years ago, and there's plenty more activities and ideas for you to use for your Pi Day or for just any day because any day is a Pi Day. Okay? And with that, let me go back and... Uh, give it to Mike the presentation so that he can finish it up. Thanks so much, Irina and Karen. Oh, I gotta skip through your stuff, I forgot about that. So before I thank you, uh, we promised that for one lucky winner, we'll be giving away a TI graphing calculator and tonight's lucky winner is 
Colette Reamer. So Colette, congratulations. We'll be in touch over email in the next couple of days to get some information from you as far as uh, what kind of calculator you'd like to receive. Um, and we're excited for your winnings. Um, to receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click that link in the chat window. Also, this is a link for the documents that were used tonight by Karen and Arena. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. And if for any reason these links are not working for you, just hang tight, and in a couple of days you'll automatically receive a follow-up email. And in that follow-up email will be links to the recording, the certificate, and the documents as well. So huge thanks to Arena and Karen for all the Pi Day activities. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a happy Pi Day and a good month of March. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy Mardi Gras today and tomorrow. And, and happy Pi Day coming up. Absolutely. And thanks, everyone, for, jo for joining us. We hope to see you back online next week. Have a good night.